welcome everybody and uh, thank you for the notification uh, uh, major thank you to dr jonathan lassa we're very happy to have you here to give a presentation on uh, measuring political will and an index of commitment to disaster risk reduction dr lassa got a phd in 2010 from the university of bonn in germany in disaster risk governance and then joined uh, the faculty of charles darwin university where he's been uh, a senior lecturer since 2016, is a tenure faculty member over there, coordinator of the Master in Public Administration, is the author of more than 100 publications, and is extremely well cited because, if I'm not mistaken, as of now, you have about 3,005 citations in Scholar Google and over 700 in Scopus. Um, Dr. Lasse is also the recipient of several awards, uh, and in the last couple of years, uh, he received the top research in the field of emergency management uh, and in science and health editors choice award so we're very happy here to have a an expert in the disaster management so dr lassa the floor is yours as we were saying before 34 for 35 minutes of presentation and the rest for q a the floor is yours sure thank you ricardo thank you damira for arranging the talk today i hope i can finish by the time in 30 minutes yeah so the title is about measuring political will and initially we want to extend from disasters to climate to sustainability but i think at the time it was too complicated to uh, bring in a lot of variables but the origin of this research came out from my phd uh, because i look at the institutions as uh, the variables that uh, will serve as kind of predictors to the sustainability of institutional commitments to emergency management in general, but some, sometimes we change into DRR, disaster risk reduction as, as some kind of key, key terms that we think could be uh, bringing a better message about how we approach disasters overall. So, and the reason why I change it into measuring political will is because I think it is too hard for, I think, even my colleague to think about institutions because uh, most of disaster management experts or communities, I think once you upon a time, it used to be predominantly engineers, scientists. So for them, uh, institution is very abstract. So, I shifted into political will. Basically, we took just a little bit from um, the approach that I used for, uh, from my PhD. And the cover here, I use it from Mary Douglas' book, uh, How Institutions Think. I, I like the way they uh, put in the cover of, of the book. And I, um, I think I didn't put Mary Douglas in purpose, just in case some of you might really actually go. Now, this is one of the motivations why I think uh, talking about institutions, governance, um, in, in more practical framing, political will is important. Um, I prepared for my PhD, I read this book uh, from UNDP, it came out in 2004. And just about the time when I want to submit my PhD thesis, um, the earthquake occurred in Haiti, and suddenly all the readings that we uh, did during, our PhD, during my PhD time kind of shocking me because if you look at the uh, UN reports, um, of course, in, in working with UN, you have to be very positive, you need to be, you know. Uh, appreciative to the member states so uh, everything looks like great you have beautiful processes that the agencies have been proud of we have participatory process but at the end of the day um, suddenly all those processes uh, seems to you know not paying off enough because uh, somehow uh, this after struck uh, and the bullying collapses um, I mean the bullying I'm not only talking for Turkey now, but I'm also uh, talking for uh, almost many countries around the world. Uh, I think uh, happy to know that you are also from Italy, Ricardo. Well, Italy also has this kind of similar problem uh, in regards to 
uh, being seismic prone region. Um, so this kind of motivates me to think about how can I tell my um, base modelers, my colleagues working as risk modelers about how can we picture, um, how can we assess, uh, you know, how nation fail and succeed in reducing their disasters. disasters. Basically, um, that kind of approach. Uh, so over time, I think in social science, at least we have been uh, grateful that at least the thinking around that nature is not the causes of the houses that collapse, but it's the way you build the houses that make them collapse is kind of have been here. I mean, have been in the social science for at least, I uh, want to calculate from those. So at least that's how some of the colleagues at the University of Delaware have been thinking about. And as a PhD students, uh, in time, we were actually happy to see some of this uh, paradigm and how those paradigms were brought into uh, risk equals exposure over time, hazard time, for vulnerability, it got a long story to, re to arrive at that uh, point because uh, once upon a time we used to think about how to convince natural hazard modeler and researcher that is not the hazard that is actually the real problem, but it is the vulnerability of the physical infrastructure Social, economic, and when I put in my topic, to institutions as well, are the variables that play also key, uh, uh, very important roles in, in shaping risk overall. So, in, in my case, uh, I said, thank you very much for everything that we have been achieving, but I think it's time to think about institution because if you want to. Um, move forward, we need to think about how we shape the existing institutions uh, to think about risk. But then we realize that when you start with institution, you start also with the political setting. And in this is the case why I think um, I reframe the PhD research into uh, what you call as um, uh, institutional vulnerability. Um, political will as a kind of the, the framing of that topic. Now, why institutions or why political will? Um, I think um, it's not that hard for some of you who are coming from sociologists or probably social psychology, especially if you are of, you know, um, you have been familiar with the work of Ron Harry or Vygotsky, uh, who have been looking at cultural institutions as some kind of variables that uh, we have to somehow uh, we cannot escape from 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 there. So because we, we look at institutions as a kind of power that shape the risk taking or this adverse behavior, and that is the reason why I think institution is so important. And um, in, I think in, in social science, it's not that hard, but in engineering or, I, I keep talking about disciplines because um, disaster management comes from 50 disciplines. And sometimes when you talk about something, it's not always clear to everyone because everybody comes from different disciplines. So that's the reason why I try to also think about and other disciplines when I talk about institutions or political way. Now, I think uh, everybody agrees that ritual is one of the uh, key features of institutions. And when we talk about political will, why we talk about rituals, I think it's, it's important to think about reframing some of the institutional features into something that we can equally measure. So, um, in one of the institutional mechanism is uh, the carrot and stick. So how we build up the awareness of some kind of failures or behaviors uh, in regards to risk. Um, we have to think about how can we use existing cultural institutions to create this kind of uh, stick and carrot uh, from childhood level until 
uh, until we are, you know, and in, in, including adults, for example. Uh, I think um, the approach uh, at the moment, I think, for disaster risk reduction, we talk about how can we engage with the children and shape their behavior right from the beginning rather than waiting. That's the reason why I think plenty of INGOs, including UNICEF, have been serious about how can we build a more child-centered approach to disaster risk reduction? Because uh, if we fail to do that, it's probably a little bit too late to shape the will of the society in the future to be more mindful about this. Um, so that's probably a little bit about institutions, um, um, you know, I think I will just skip this the document rewards. Basically, um, we want to create some sort of institutionalized model. So institutions not are not only talking about formal laws, regulations, and stuff, but we talk about the informal setting, the informal institutions, um, from culture to values um, to all things that we can somehow utilize to to bend them towards you know risk awareness so what is an institution um and what is an institution in disaster management i think that's the key features uh, before we uh, come up with the model of measuring institutional vulnerabilities and in this case how i change institutional vulnerability into a political will so uh, one of the famous definition is from douglas north i think um, he got a uh, Nobel Prize in economics, uh, in economics in 1993. Um, so he said that institutions are humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interaction. And they can be informal, they can be formal, and the formal one is the, what we call as all institutionalism. You can talk about constitutions, laws, property, property rights, so you can talk about regulations and so on. But uh, we need to also look at the informal institutions like taboos, sanction, custom, tradition, and so on. Um, they are somehow devised by human beings to create order, to reduce uncertainty. And this is, in this part, we talk about disaster as well. Uh, now, the, we move to the next uh, background, why I was interested in measuring. Uh, quantifying this because we need to somehow do that at the global comparative kind of experiment or exercises. So there is one doctrine that I, once upon a time as a student, we uh, study this often. I call it mitigation doctrine. That wherever you go, you spend one dollar and you will get avoided losses two, three, four, seven, ten, depending on what paper you read, depending on the claim from the colleagues, depending on the context where this uh, ratio is being done. So uh, for me, it was okay. Uh, I think we need to convince people and uh, politicians in general that if you want to invest in risk reduction or res resilience or climate adaptation, and then we think that that is not only investment, but you will get some sort of uh, what you call um, outcomes from there, um, avoided losses. Um, but uh, I think some of the colleagues from LSE, uh, um, uh, University of London, I think they come up with the ideas that maybe we do not only propose, you know, propose or promote avoided losses as a promise, but we can also think about dividends as a kind of new framing to convince politicians and businesses to think about risk. And how can we invest in risk? Meaning that if you invest in risk, you're not only having avoided losses, but you can also gain a lot from that. So that's the reason why uh, I think this is um, pretty interesting. But the problem is, um, to be honest, it's not everywhere, every place that can bring you the good story about that, you know, the fact that avoided losses will be higher than the investment cost. Uh, it depends on institutions. Um, so if you don't have a good institutional setting, you will, will not get a positive outcome. So what you get is probably more and more losses and damages. 
And that's the, the whole idea that uh, even in real life business, every role in person doesn't always lead to better game. That's my point. So before you um, come up with more convincing messages to some of the uh, stakeholders, we need to think about uh, institutional quality before we move forward. So I draw this up during my PhD time. Um, at the time I draw this up because I feel, feel like uh, my colleagues couldn't understand my point. So the point is you have the institutional vulnerability at the uh, at one uh, axis and then you have the sorceries. The higher the vulnerability of your institutions, you will have higher disasters. Um, the problem is the quality of institutions are quite different. So you need to have at least three scenarios. The first scenario is that it is fairly linear. The second scenario is you have probably better institutional quality. Um, so your disaster is doesn't always correspond linearly to your level of vulnerability. And the scenario number three is uh, the one that uh, I also call as country C. Uh, you can see that it might have higher vulnerability, but it has like a lower level of disasters because hypothetically speaking, they have better institutions. It's a little bit complicated, but I hope you, you get the, the idea. Uh, I think I come to the conclusion that this is a little bit myth that investment is always coming with something positive. I think I will just skip this because this is a repetition from the previous slide. Um, yeah, so pretty often we talk about uh, institutions uh, simply, uh, you know, based on the tax. But in here, I look at the institutions beyond that. Uh, you look at the way the handyman fixes their bar, there are always institutions embedded in there because you can precisely, as an engineer, if you are trained as an engineer, you will be always telling how they fix the bar and you will tell that that is probably referring to all institutions, meaning the building codes, all building codes. So um, institutions is always embedded in all the material realities uh, on the ground. And that is um, pretty much something that a, uh, I think is uh, excited about studying institution. Now, um, overall, I think there is a very limited resources in the such studies. Uh, it's heaps in environmental research and environmental management, but I think in disaster policy, not that many talking about institutions. One of the best book, I think, uh, written by John Hammer and Stephen Dovers. I think I uh, used to tell John uh, Hammer that this is one of the best book about institutions for emergency managers uh, around the world. Um, so for the presentation today, I'm actually talking about institutions, but I reframe as a political will because I think using the frame political will, it, it is more catchy to uh, draw attention from many uh, scholars in the social studies, in the social risk management studies. And I think that is, that could be true because uh, even this paper uh, received uh, good, good enough citations so far, I think. Uh, I think because uh, it offers a little bit more operational framework when we talk about political work. So the basic assumption is the differences in quality of institutions lead to differences in the outcomes of risk management. Uh, I go back to the same hypothesis of uh, institutional study here. Uh, and I think since I'm achieving probably 20 minutes already, or not yet, but I will probably jump from here. I hope you get some of this before, before I miss my basic points in, in, the, in the paper. So this is how we define institutional vulnerability. But uh, I think this is how we change it into a political way. So there are five variables that I use. The first one is risk knowledge. The reason why risk knowledge is always come into the picture is because from Sendai, from, from Hyogo framework for the social reduction, 2015, 2000, 
2015, and then we have Sendai Framework 2015-2030, uh, risk knowledge has always come into the picture. So we measure risk uh, knowledge at two levels. One is the ability, and then the second one is the willingness to understand risk. And then we put some variables like disaster governability. I think uh, this is a very frame, a good frame. So we want to look at the general governability, looking at the World Bank global governance indicators. And then we look at the specific disaster risk reduction and governability. Basically, we try to code from Sendai and Kyogo frameworks and using some of the countries' reports to come up with a, a global data set so we can compare countries to countries. And then we have the disaster risk reduction investment. Uh, so investment doesn't have to be meaning it comes from private sectors, but it's also coming from the states. So I use the Maria Matuzato from UCL's uh, the concept of state or governments as the origin of the kind of investment. Let's say like that. Uh, the, the fourth point is bureaucratic preparedness. So we look at the general variables of you know how prompt uh, governments bureaucracy, uh, including uh, in, in the measure it includes. Uh, you know, how fast uh, your business uh, permit is being issued by government when you process that. And we use those kind of indicators to inform or to also measure together. Uh, we do some regression uh, with preparedness measure. Uh, this is the preparedness measure coming from, coming out from government reports uh, that we call from Togo and Sendai uh, reports. Uh, so just to give you an idea that uh, at least 160 governments send their reports during uh, 2005 to 2050 about what they have been doing, and there were at least 24 indicators that we could actually play with, and they provide some of the explanation why they rank, why they put the rating, um, like one out of five, they put three, what does it mean? Uh, there is always a standard test. So we can equip them per country to country. Uh, and the last one is error warning system. Somehow we didn't put error warning system into the variables at the end. So after we come up with those predictors of you know, uh, summing up from all the indicators, we go into comparing with the risk level. So we try to run some sort of um, regression to, to see whether uh, the uh, regression model uh, say something about the correlation between risk level and then the, the political uh, indicators. And this is the result. So this is one of the results. There are probably five or seven maps that we produce. Uh, probably we can produce as many as we want because there are at least uh, 30, 40 variables that we can play around. But just to save time, uh, in general, you will have this kind of uh, not really confirmation bias, but it's kind of not surprising result because you will see that countries that are quite rich are those who perform better in terms of disaster risk governability, um, while those who are actually somewhere in the middle, they also get this disaster governability indicator in the middle. Um, so uh, sometimes I, I'm worried whether we are kind of confirming what had been uh, initially believed already uh, when you look at the global governance indicators and the distribution of these uh, governance uh, events uh, that, that come up with these pictures uh, from, you know, in this case, the green is the better. Uh, and the red is kind of the question mark. Um, so this is it. Um, the point is how we generate meaning out of this. So the meaning is, uh, I think uh, I somehow I didn't provide uh, the other uh, scatter plots so you can see how we come up with the results, but you can look at the papers that I also sent uh, to you. 
Um, the scattered plot is quite convincing. It's very easy, and I think we can update the progress from year to year, uh, so we can look at the differences uh, in the in years to come. But overall, we want to create a sense that if you have good governance, kind of uh, performance or indicators, but the better you have it, the the better we can predict that you will have a better outcomes in the self risk reduction. So my point uh, of this thesis is sometimes you cannot simply uh, use the so you don't have to use disaster management information because they are not available everywhere. Countries do not always report consistently. So uh, my point is you can simply use the mainstream um, disaster risk sorry you can use mainstream governance indicators and that will be somehow over as a good predictor about how likely countries are going to reduce or are going to be more committed to reduce their risk that's kind of the bottom line uh, that, that we achieve so we are quite at least i'm quite convinced um, but again i'm quite also cautious that maybe we are kind of doing not where the science, but it's kind of confirmation bias. That is something that I want to avoid, and I think at the time um, we are trying to be critical with our own approach as well. But uh, in the end, I think if you want to go into global mapping about progress in this reservation between countries, then this could be one of the methods that uh, some of the Specialized agencies working on risk ranking uh, could also look at. That's probably the, the bottom line. Now, um, now I think the why this is important because this is a growing uh, focus on institutions um, over the last ten years. Is my case. When I started, I think only a few, less than five, papers talked about institutional vulnerability, uh, and they were not talking about disaster. In the context of disaster, I think the only paper that talks about disaster was coming from, I think, Louis Level at the University of Chiang Mai at the time. Um, other than that, we don't have it. But my concern is the more you have this term on the rise, meaning that people are really struggling with the institutions. So, um, I'm talking about proxy here. And this is also another way of saying disaster risk governance or disaster governance, because when I started my PhD, Nobody actually defined that, so I tried to step in and define what is actually such governance. And you can see now the term is becoming a uh, popular um, at least. Um, so to conclude, I provide this uh, slide because I want to show you that there is a very complex uh, institutional structure where you talk at the international level or you talk at the local level. And most of the people are trapped in their disciplinary uh, boundaries. So it's a little bit hard when we talk about um, disaster in general and when you want to measure something that at the end of the day you want it to be used to inform or at least to uh, incentivize actors to be more committed. To, to disasters, but before they are doing that, I think what my what what my point was the uh, the need to recognize that we need to work across the boundaries before we uh, you know step in and then do something um, going forward. That's probably um, the last slide of mine. That is slightly. Coming out of the blue, not really related to my uh, paper that I promise I will be talking about just the paper, but just to give you a, about the context that there are actually complex uh, commitment in there because we want um, to mainstream this address reduction in development, but somehow we find that political will is not always there. So how can we go about it? Um, can we? Develop something that you know push uh, the government to think about um, how can they do better. 
of course, with the with the assumption that when you do ranking like this, uh, you embed the carrot and state approach into the conversation. Uh, that's probably um, my 30 minute talk for today. Probably going back to you, Marika. Right. Jonathan, thank you so much. I think uh, we can open the floor for Q&A. Anybody who has a question, just ask or raise your virtual hand uh, and ask the question. Professor Nanowski. Hello, hello, uh, Jonathan. My internet is a bit slow, so... Uh, Perhaps you can hear me, but uh, how, how do you find do you define disasters? And uh, are you talking about natural di di uh, disasters or uh, and uh, what different kinds of, of disasters? I mean, does good governance um, indicate a management of certain kind of disasters? Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Prof. Nanoski. Um, yeah, so th that's good that you clarify, uh, ask me to clarify that, so my position. Um, so traditionally, people define this other into natural versus non natural. So human made versus natural. But uh, in I think it is still useful to do that, but um, I use different approach in here. So we try to, so this is the problem with me. So I was even at time when we, I did my PhD, I, I used the critical thinking, the critical disaster studies, that disaster is, uh, earthquakes are not disasters. So there's no such thing as natural disasters. That's kind of, it was the idea. Uh, all disasters came down into always engaged with human variables. So most of disasters are man made. Um, so, where you talk about earthquakes in Turkey, uh, it, that is obviously man made. And if you look at the government trying to hunt down some of the contractors, uh, constructors, that indicates that they also somehow utilize or uh, borrow the concept of, you know, uh, earthquake is not natural disaster, but it's actually a technological hazard. So what you see in Turkey and Syria at the moment, it, it is not a natural phenomenon, but it is a natural, oh, sorry, that is the, we call it NATEC. NATEC is the natural and technological variables work hand in hand and then uh, it, problems whenever you don't have the resilience. So in that sense, I hope I clarifies about my position, but since I'm getting older, I want to go into deeper explanation about things. So you might get different answer from me in the next 10 years, because I'm started learning about the theory of language, um, things like hidden signs, uh, and the way we understand language and how language help us to understand the phenomenon. So I'm probably having different answer in the next 10 years uh, about disasters. But at the moment, I, at the time when we use this, we use the, the critical disasters course. There is a new movement called non-natural disasters. Uh, they have conferences every year. They don't believe in the strict divide of natural versus many. Professor Howie. Jonathan, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, I'm looking at your your map here, and I'm curious about India. Uh, I am quite shocked that India is dark green. It seems like it's an outlier relative to uh, for for many of your um, you know indicators. So, w can you explain to me why India's dark green? Because First of all, you know, you look at it's developed. It, it doesn't have a lot of money. It's not a developed nation. Yeah. It's got issues with education. 
uh, which is the, the, risk, the no, risk knowledge factor. So why is it dark green? And another thing is it's got, it, it has cyclones coming in quite often. So, you know, is that the reason? Is it because of the number of uh, cyclones so they're actually used to having disasters? Or wh why do you think it's, it seems like an outlier to the other countries? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor. I think you spot it on right away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the problem with the global mapping. I think if you look at the UN global mapping, they put Brunei Darussalam as the top number three uh, high risk um, because uh, you know that's the problem. But yeah, uh, just to give you some ideas that um, um, we also asked this because at the time we want to make sure to make it like. If you increase like by 7.5, then India will be falling down into the next group. So uh, we discussed about that among ourselves, but we, uh, somehow we didn't really ex also explain in the paper about why India came out as a kind of outlier there. Outlier there. But I was happy to see that uh, during the super cyclone uh, last year uh, in Orissa, the outcomes coming out from that cyclone have been positive because if you compare with the same magnitude in 1999, where almost 15,000 people died, well, informal statistics went up more than that, but uh, I think the one last year, uh, it was only, I think, one people died. So in terms of institutional processes, they, are, they have been trying. Uh, institutional quality are not that good, especially when you talk about Modi, uh, at the moment, I, uh, I actually prepared one talk for this uh, talk today. I wanted to talk about crisis, uh, the archetype of crisis management, so crisis leadership in Asia. Um, Modi is one of the variables. And if you follow India, Modi never show up during the press conferences throughout the pandemic. So his way of crisis management is also very awkward. Are hiding behind, they are coming from the dark. So by automatic, I think you you got the right, you 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 got it um, right when you spot the India because India is somehow turn uh, of what you call this. But I think it could be because the reporting system to the UN has been very. Uh, based on the, what they have been doing at that moment. So that's probably the reason why we come up with a kind of out there uh, in the case of India. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Frazier and then Professor Karini. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Professor Lassa, for a very interesting presentation. My, my, my question, is, it's, it's rather technical, maybe it's kind of in the weeds, but it, it, it actually builds on, um, on Professor Howie's uh, question, um, which is, I, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the governability index here on the map and your five categories from low to high. And I'm just wondering about the, um, about the decision to break the categories into these different percentage levels where the red is 35%, uh, yeah. and then orange is 10 and, the middle is 15, light green is 10, and the top is 30, instead of dividing them into like 20% for each. Does your paper speak to that? Was there a decision criteria for how to uh, break those, those categories down into, their, into these percentages? Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Fraser. I think there is some subjectivity in the process. Um, we tried to do it like, to do it more like um, there is a technique around that to make it more like provided by the model but I, we didn't feel right about that uh, and then we tried to make it 20 20 20 but i feel like most of the countries will be skewed towards in the middle so um i think it is what it is at the moment <laughs> uh, i think uh, we could probably make it like 25 uh, and then you will be also puzzled with the fact that uh, some countries like China will come 
and will be uh, some part of Africa will be also come and sit together with some of the countries from OECD, for example, which is okay if that's the case. But um, yeah, um, we discussed that among ourselves, and at the time we think that mobilities will be the less least problem. Uh, of course, there is subjectivity in there, but um, um, it's quite common when it comes to mapping like this. Um, look at we look at the colleagues from UNU in Bonn. They also come up with a more like catchy uh, decision about where to create this kind of criteria. Um, to some degree, it signals some degree of subjectivity in this mission. Professor Carini. Hello, Jonathan, uh, if I may, nice to meet you. Uh, so my question is rather conceptual and uh, I apologize if I missed it during your presentation because acoustics are not great tonight, but uh, I was wondering if you could please nail down for us this concept of governability versus governance. There is disagreement in literature about how we define governance per se as including the quality of public services, public trust, the quality of civil service per se, and I was wondering whether or not we can sort of redefine this concept that you have shared with us today, which applies very differently to different enclaves of public affairs, but at yeah. least how you define it as related to disaster management. And again, I apologize if I missed it during your presentation, but uh, uh, I was wondering uh, about your take on that. Uh, thank you, Professor Karin. Uh, don't worry about missing something because I didn't actually explain about the concept of governance right from the beginning, but I think you, I think most of you, I'm not sure, I assume coming from political science or probably social science. Um, so the governance come up with some kind of um, definition that uh, we believe is a kind of movement in um, 60s, 1960s as a global war where government didn't work, so you need something to move beyond government, so you need different powers. That Sorry, open. Jonathan, is there anything you can do about the acoustics? Because I cannot hear clearly at all, right? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, slightly better, yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so the governance concept uh, that I think at least students um, in Europe back in time um, understood it as a kind of the way we think about governing public affairs beyond government. So you need different power civil societies, and, uh, different actors uh, that mm -hmm. are not traditionally, you know, just focus on government. Uh, and with that, you can, we come up with the indicators of good governance in, in this process, like. Uh, corruption measure, anti-corruption measures, um, government effectiveness. Um, so we put all the six variables from the world governance indicators, including, uh, I think, um, uh, accountability measures, um, media freedom uh, into the into the pictures, and then we put um, because in in Sende, in Hugo framework there is um, the features that. Uh, there are some features, especially in the Hugo, Sunday, sorry, Hugo priority number one, where they put at least civil society participation. And this is by this, they measure by the existence of disaster risk reduction photos across the world. And the, the variables number two is the existence of, I think, um, public fines. Mm -hmm. And there is also another variable that somehow we use it to fit with the, to make it like, uh, I, I think I put it here. Um, yeah. So yeah, we put okay. their governability, meaning that the governments have been able to govern certain type of uh, activities that are pertinent to disaster reduction. So we, we use that information and then we combine with uh, global governance indicators. And my interest was to see the differences between those types because 
to me, the extent of civil society working in disaster risk reduction cannot be independent of the civil society participation overall. So they somehow can be related. So that's, but data wise, I use the data from global governance indicator independent of the country reports. And then we combine them together to come up with disaster governability. Okay. The reason why we put governability is simply because we want some practical measures to show that in order to be able to govern your disasters, uh, you need to have this governability. Um, and that is uh, the reason why we come up with this. But, but yeah, the whole idea is kind of going back to direct governance uh, mm. in political institutions. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? It looks like it, that you have satisfied our curiosity. We may not be able yet to manage Yeah, so the mirror, I'm just leaving around. Thank you, Dr. Lassa. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye.